The Creative Community is brought to you in part by a generous grant provided by the Diana and Simon Rabb Foundation. Welcome to the latest edition of The Creative Community. I'm your host David Starkey and this time we're going to visit three arts organizations in Santa Barbara. First we'll go to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art where we'll talk to Karen Sensheimer, Curator of Photography. Then we'll walk down the street and talk to Jonathan Fox, Executive Director of the Ensemble Theater. Finally, we'll look to Arts and Lectures, and we'll talk to Celeste Vellici and Roman Baratiek. Welcome to the Creative Community. Sensheimer, Curator of Photography at Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Thank you so much for having us into the, the museum. Oh, I'm delighted you're here, and I'm delighted that this exhibition after four years has finally happened. Four years, yeah. It's been a four-year project. Well, we're looking behind us, it says John Devola, as far as I could get, and before the camera started rolling, you were telling me that John Devola is a name who every photographer knows, right. but that a lot of people outside of the world of, of art photography would be unfamiliar with. I know. Everyone within the field says, I love his work. Yeah. Outside the field, they say, John who? Right. So I want to tell you who John is, because he's one of the most important photographers, I think. And it's so interesting that he's finally been rediscovered after about four decades. He studied with Robert Heineken at UCLA in the 70s, so he's a conceptual photographer. Okay. And he's very, very interested in the idea that the photograph is a specific moment in time, place, and it's, it's an exact record. But at the same time, he said, what you're looking at may not be true at all. So as a graduate student, vandalism was his first series. Vandalism, okay. It's vandalism. And he, he never trespassed, but he used abandoned houses as his studio. Mm -hmm. He was a graduate student. He was poor. So he'd find these abandoned houses and he'd go in and he'd make marks in order to make the space interesting mm -hmm. photographically. He's um, not so well known as perhaps other conceptual artists of the time, and of course Robert Rauschenberg, mm -hmm. John Baldessari, Ed Boucher all come to mind, but he steadfastly remained a photographer. And of course photography was in the backwater in, in the 70s uh -huh. and 80s, and it's only recently been I think seriously considered an art form. So as, as we walked around this room, we were looking at these pieces, as you said, they're marked, they look like they could come from the shoe-ash in, in exactly. some cases. Exactly, exactly. He's not a painter. He likes to activate, what he said, he likes to activate a space and make it energetic and make it interesting for the photograph. So you'll notice he paints in corners and they look three-dimensional, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or he'll paint in the, on, in the corners and make them come out and seem almost sculptural. Right. So he's interested in what he says, what he calls activating the space. And at the same time, he's saying this is all artificial. Mm -hmm. This is a made-up environment. Mm -hmm. So he's interested in that dichotomy between the exactitude of the photograph versus the absolute fakeness, the artificial uh, yeah, quality uh, of it. scene. Yeah. And now, this is a big, big uh, project here. The yes. Santa Barbara Museum of Art is the lead institution, but it's also at, at LACMA? It's at the LA County Museum, a smaller group of, of photographs, and also at the Pomona College Museum okay. of Art. Okay. So I felt it was important that we had a collaborative project because John is a Southern Californian through and through. He's born, bred, and raised here. He mm -hmm. teaches at the University of California, Riverside. Mm -hmm. And so I felt it was important that he have a big Southern California presence. Yeah. Well, let's go into the next room here and take a look at uh, this next body of work. Great. The Vandalism series was discovered by John Sarkowski. Um, he was curator at the Museum of Modern Art, and he was assembling an exhibition titled Mirrors and Windows. So John, as a freshly minted graduate student, his work, the work from vandalism was included in that exhibition. So you can imagine, he was immediately noticed by very, very important curators and critics and other mm -hmm. artists, mm -hmm. but he's remained kind of under the radar. Right. This is a series that John started immediately out of graduate school, and he discovered that there were whole neighborhoods around the LAX airport that had been purchased by the city to abate the noise. Mm -hmm. So he decided to do what he called forced entries, and he, didn't, he himself did not do forced entries. If, if it said do not enter, if it had a fence, he would not trespass. Mm -hmm. But he found all of these houses, and he was very interested in all of the unseen actors and the, the uh, vandals and other mm -hmm. things that would take place. So he said Monday through Friday the city would mow the grass, Saturday the vandals, the unseen, unseen participants mm -hmm. would come in, make their marks, and on Sunday he'd photograph. Right. So 
you'll notice that this exhibition has no labels, it has no titles, because the titles are really not very indicative of what the work is. So we've produced a little gallery guide. It gives you a map of where all the Devola pieces are. And then inside, it gives you a thumbnail okay. with all the titles so that you can take it away with you and you have a reference point. Well, that's interesting, though, because oftentimes when you're in a gallery like this, your eye goes first to the label exactly. and then back to the image. And exactly. so there's no way to do that right now. No, and what we found is that people are looking more carefully at the image because there's no label to mm -hmm. read first. Yeah. So we're trying to, again, enhance the visual experience. And with John, I mean, that's exactly what he wants to have yeah. done. He's not interested in giving you information in the title. They're mm -hmm. very kind of uh, non-descriptive. Very generic, yeah. This, this is interesting, too, with both the vandalism series and, and, and here with the LAX uh, abatement, um, we see how impermanent housing is in, in Southern California, exactly. you know, and that's one of the, the themes I think a lot of artists that we saw in Pacific Standard Time were, were working with is to what extent have we marred the landscape, mm -hmm. to what extent have we accentuated it as it devolves in this case what's left over and, and it is art, clearly. Exactly, and all of this is now gone because yeah. a lot of these houses were either bulldozed, moved, or they just fell apart. Mm -hmm. So this this whole area now is around the LAX airport. Mm -hmm. It's all empty of, of it's long gone. human habitation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a record of something. It's a, rec it's a record. It's a very specific moment in time and place. But as John said, um, it really is this artificial and this, again, this ephemeral um, scene. Mm -hmm. As you look through these pieces, I mean, there's one here with the Pink Floyd, uh, you yes, know, uh, yes. spray paint. It, it does seem of an era, of the 70s, early very 70s. Very much so, very much so. The, the, there was a recession in 1973, so a lot of houses, sound familiar? A lot of houses were abandoned. Mm -hmm. A lot of houses had to be, um, had to, people just had to leave their houses. Right, right. So he finds these houses, he would travel all around Los Angeles as a graduate student and then following a graduate work. So mm -hmm. he's always looked at the Southern California landscape and cityscape. That's mm -hmm. been his haunting ground. In the first two rooms, we, we haven't seen a living creature at all, but when we're going to go to the next room, we are going to see uh, yes. some dogs. Yes, so, we are. <laughs> shall we take a look? Let's do it. Karen, we're walking in here and there are, are dogs everywhere. These yes. dogs are, are in a lot of motion, aren't they? Oh, they're running after his truck. Yeah. He did a series in the desert of isolated houses, which is not on view. That's been seen quite a bit. But he'd find that these dogs would suddenly appear out of nowhere and start racing his truck. It's probably the highlight of their day. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if you stop, they would just stand there and wag their tails. So they weren't dangerous, although I have to say that this dog one over here looks, looks pretty a little mean. dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I think I would not get out of my yeah. truck. But he loved these dogs, so he decided he had to photograph them, but he didn't know how to do that and keep the car moving. So he put a motorized 35 millimeter on his windowsill, and he didn't quite know what he would get, mm -hmm. and he just would take rolls of film. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there's 36 frames, and that's an average roll of film, mm -hmm. and, he, and then he would extract certain images from that. Mm -hmm. We own this particular piece, which I love because it's reminiscent of a 19th century photographer named Edward Muybridge, and he did studies of animal lo locomotion. We think of do uh, the horses in particular, right? Horses in particular, he proved that all four hooves were off the ground, mm -hmm. which painters, of course, never believed. Nobody had believed until it was proved photographically. Mm -hmm. But I love to see the blur and the motion because you get the sense of such velocity and mm -hmm. such energy and such honestly delight and of course you know that the dog's never going to ca catch the truck and mm -hmm. you know that if you caught the truck what would he do with it <laughs> <laughs> well it's interesting you, you you just said 35 or 36 uh, frames mm -hmm. the role of film are we talking about film film these are still film uh -huh. uh, John worked uh, largely in film four by five mm -hmm. uh, generally but of course with this series he was working with with 35 millimeter mm -hmm. But he loved the blur that you achieved. He used uh, very grainy film. Mm -hmm. So you get this sense of this energy and this landscape that's, you know, whizzing by. Um, so I think that it works beautifully. He, he scans down to every grain in the, in the film. So you, get, you don't get pixelation, but what you get is this really incredible mm -hmm. uh, filmic quality. Mm -hmm. So the dog is sort of in focus, 
but he, you can tell he's running at full tilt. Yeah. And I think my favorite Your dog, favorite is yes, over there, he's yeah. just all heart and earnestness. You know, yeah. you, he just knows if he runs hard enough, he's going to catch that truck. <laughs> that's right, yeah. But that's it. That's the essence of German Shepherd right there. Yeah, I know. Um, and, and when we got up really close to that, we could see it almost looked like a charcoal drawing. It does, it really does. Because of the does. process you're describing. Yeah, no, the backgrounds are blurred for a reason, and mm -hmm. he really achieved something quite wonderful. So this is a very joyous series and not something that we think of John Devola um, as doing. Um, he's generally in very isolated. Pretty dark, yeah. yeah. It is. The title, in fact, as far as I could get, comes from a series that he did where he would set the timer on his camera and then he'd run for 10 seconds as far as he could get. So in that 10 seconds, all you see is this blurry figure mm. in the distance mm -hmm. and the shutter would go off. So that's, um, that's about as much as you see of John Devola, yeah. although he is in his Theodore Project Street. Well, let's go into the next uh, room which, where we have some pieces that look like they could be paintings. Yes, uh, they do. Indeed. This is a moody room, Karen. It is, it really is. It's, it's one of my favorite rooms. John Devola had never seen all eight of these pieces installed in one place, so he was very, uh, he was very moved by the whole room. Um, what he did is take flower and paint. So he's playing with the idea of spiritual iconography. They look very beautiful. They look like spirits evolving, evanescing. But what it really is is black matte paint. And he took a roll of, film, roll of paper, painted it with the, the paint, and then threw flower at it, flash bar on top of the, of the image. And so he, he would capture this, this flower falling at, or, or sticking to the surface. Uh, and then he'd take that piece of paper, tear it off. So you see the torn paper, yeah, you see yeah. push pins, because he loves the idea, again, that this is an artificial, an artificial subject, but he's made it very ethereal and very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, when I first saw that, it almost struck me as like a colorblind Mark Rothko or something like that. I know, it's that. really true. It looks like a Rothko chapel. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to create a room where people could sit and just contemplate and let, and let the images sort of emerge for, mm -hmm. for them. I think it's, um, you'll notice they're about very industrial frames because he wanted to play with the idea of really common materials, tough materials, but at the same time he's using this um, flower and, and paper mm -hmm. and paint mm -hmm. to create this absolutely otherworldly feeling. Yeah, it really is fantastic. Well, on the far wall over here we have these two pieces called Dark Star. Maybe right. we can walk over there and take a look. The Dark Stars were painted again by John in an abandoned house. And the dark stars look like these alien presences. They almost have a sculptural quality to them. Again, it's John's, he, t he uses flash to light them. Mm -hmm. um, but he likes the idea of playing with the, this otherworldly uh, presence while at the same time you're in this very homely, simple, abandoned house. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, he doesn't trespass, he just finds these houses and he said, I don't consider that I'm, gra I'm doing graffiti, I'm just activating the space. Mm -hmm. So you can see this smaller one here in this uh, abandoned house. Now we're, we're seeing color for the first time since we entered exactly. the, the show. It's very muted it's though. Very I mean, muted. We can barely see it. There's a little hint of it in the window and the outside here. Mm -hmm. But we're going to walk into this next room and suddenly, boom, <laughs> color is going to be really color. important. Well, when John did his Zoom and Beach series, the only 4x5 uh, transparency film was made for Portrait Studio, so it was Ektachrome, mm -hmm. which fades. So he's gone back and he's reprinted a lot of his Zuma Beach. And that, that particular series or part of it is on view at Pomona. Yeah. But these are really remarkable series because what he did is he took the dark stars that you see in this room, in, this, in an abandoned house, then he goes back five years later, and what he finds is that all these actors and players have been in the space. Mm -hmm. But he, he uses a very interesting um, method of taking this very large piece. He found out that the, the Mars rovers had a gigapan robot, so you can attach your camera to it, you set the parameters for the upper left, bottom right, mm -hmm. and then it takes anywhere from 70 to 120 photographs, which you can then seamlessly merge together, stitch together in your computer, so that it looks like one image and if you'll notice everything is just tack sharp there your eyes your eye can't see that sharp mm -hmm. but everything is sharp so that it's comprised of maybe 120 uh, separate photographs all merged together so he's you can see that there's an active beehive here and the dark stars you'll we'll see what uh, painters have done to them you'll see looks like sort of an ayatollah here 
and you see the, out the back door. Now this, this is the only part that's a little blurry because it's so far removed mm -hmm. from the planar mm -hmm. field. Let's go take a look at this piece over here. Um, well, it's, it's a little disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> it is disturbing because there's a lot of really hated, hateful graffiti. Yeah. There's a lot of, well, Kill Whitey, Malcolm X, evolution with guns. He's cut off the R, obviously. And here's John in the frame. Now mm -hmm. we're seeing his actual presence. Mm -hmm. I asked him how he did this, and he set the, the gig robotic uh, camera, gig pan, to make the uh, separate frames up and down, up and down. And then he stood in the frame, and then he superimposed this part into his oh, photograph. Okay. Okay. But you, can t you can't tell it. Yeah. It's seamless. Yeah. And of course, he, he's completely digital now. Yeah. He's gone completely away from film. Okay. So it's and, and, and I love the way that he's covered by this rotting insulation. <laughs> well, you never quite see his face. He's, no. he, he's there. He's uh -huh. more of a presence than he's been in anything else. But you don't really quite see him. What else do we see in this room that you think is particularly important for us to take a look at? I think what's really interesting is this piece down here. This is the set piece of where the house is. Okay. Moreno Valley, and this is the house. Um, and he's what he's done is he 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 loves an event. So the event happens to be a solar eclipse. So you'll notice the sky. The solar eclipse starts here. Mm -hmm. The solar eclipse ended here. So you'll notice that the sky gets much lighter. Mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting play on the passing of time, the temporal quality of this gigapan uh, robotic mm -hmm. uh, method of taking a photograph. So. It's over a span of about 15 minutes. Well, I'm, I'm interested, again, to see all these places that are conventionally ugly, unappealing, exactly. and, and the fact that he's lavished so much attention on, exactly. on these, these scenes. That's just something central to his aesthetic. Exactly. exactly. And he's, he's really interested, again, that the house is gone. Mm -hmm. It's been bulldozed. He went back to find it, and it was gone. And so this is the scene out the back door. Mm. And this is called his landscape for Antonioni in reference to blow up, because if you look very, very carefully, you'll see John lying in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little joke, but, oh, yeah. but this is the scene out of that back door, which is in the opposite, opposite uh, yeah. end of the gallery. So I hope that people will come to know who John Devola is. He's so well known in the field, but everyone outside the field mm -hmm. has hardly heard of him, mm -hmm. and he deserves to be known. It's very interesting that he was in the Sandra Pompidou show in 2006, which looked at L.A., mm -hmm. the L.A. art scene. Mm -hmm. So um, now New York is finally discovering that California indeed has some artists. Okay, that's so good I know. think that Robert Heineken, who was his teacher, will be having a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art next March. Okay. So I think it's, his time has finally come. Okay, connecting. So uh, as we wrap up and um, we say goodbye to viewers, tell us how long the show is going to be running. The show here is up through January 12th. Uh, it ends in Pomona at the end of December, and uh, the room at LACMA will be up through next July. They're, they're keeping it for a longer okay. time. But they're all up, they're all simultaneously up now on view, and there's one publication. So I hope that you can- Gorgeous catalog, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you can drive 170 miles and see all three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much for coming. that the renovations have been really extensive. I mean, this whole landing is new, and in fact, that wheelchair ramp is new, um, and gives it a real dramatic front to the building, which didn't really exist before. Uh, and so, as you can see here in the lobby, we have brand new box office, new restrooms for both men and women, lots of facilities for both, uh, great new industrial lighting throughout the building, in fact, it's really a state-of-the-art system. Oh, the, fly, the fly system is state-of-the-art. And um, so it's just, it's, it's an exciting yeah. space. Yeah. Well, as I, you know, the restrooms themselves would be <laughs> worth yeah. the price of the renovation. Yeah. Um, we are in, a, this is a noisy, crowded space and it's full of workers. Right. Let's go talk someplace else a little bit quieter. Okay. Right. okay. <laughs> Yeah.
and uh, thank you for welcoming us to the balcony of the uh, Arts and Culture Center here. It's a cool space. Yeah, it is a really cool space. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many arts uh, institutions uh, housed in here. And yeah. Ensemble Theater is one of them. That's right. Yeah, the Granada Symphony, Opera, and lots of other organizations yeah. are here. So we're here because um, we wanted to be in your new theater, the Ensemble mm -hmm. Theater's fantastic new theater, but they're, they're laying floor tile right now. They're laying down the flooring. It's, they're supposed to be finished construction in about 10 days from now. Mm -hmm. So it's a very critical time and the carpet and tile and all that go, goes in last and then the seat, well, second to the last and then finally the seats come in at the mm -hmm. very end. Okay. So, I mean, this has been a big project. This has been a theme of ours every time we meet once a year. I know, next year we won't know what to talk about. I know, that's right. Hopefully everything will be going so great. <laughs> right, that, yeah. right. But um, it, it's December the 5th is the, is the opening night, right? So December 5th is, is uh, when we begin performances okay. of our first show of the season. December 7th is actually the official opening okay. of that performance. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, that production. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can remember when you first started thinking we ought to get a new theater. This was some years ago, and you know, a lot of artistic directors like yourself will lead a theater company through a number of great seasons as you have, but not everybody has to build have a whole new <laughs> theater. Well, you know, this was a this was a long time coming. This was a part of Ensemble's long-term plans even before I came to Santa Barbara there was a, a, at least one other project of uh, where Ensemble was looking to build a new, uh, a new theater, a new facility. Uh, and then that, uh, because the land deal fell through, it got put on hold. And when I arrived, uh, the plan was, at least in the short term, to stay at the Alacama. But it w I realized it was important to Ensemble's long-term plans to really begin the process of uh, looking again at a new facility. And uh, that was about six years ago. I, 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 I came on board seven years ago. And uh, six years ago we really started the, to, go, to, to do the whole planning. Uh, the Victoria Theater became available. We took a look with a couple of architects. They said, you know, you could turn this into a wonderful 300-seat theater. Mm -hmm. And that was what we really wanted, was a 300-seat theater, because they're, 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 that's the perfect space for us. But there also are not any other 300-seat theaters in Santa Barbara. So it really serves a niche for the entire performing arts community. Uh, it's really the perfect size between where we were, the Alacama, which was 140, and the next highest, which is uh, the Libero at 670. So the Alacama was, was never a, a, a theater that you guys loaned out to other people, I mean, right? It oh, always, very rarely. Yeah, it right. was very rarely available for rent. We are keen on renting out the Victoria as much as we can and in fact we think that there are a lot of nights through the year that we'll be able to rent it out and we are hoping that it'll be of interest to other performing arts organizations. Arts and Lectures have already booked uh, uh, several dates for this okay. next year and um, but we think it'll be a great place for music, chamber music, jazz music, dance, uh, lectures, readings, um, so, Even so some great events that can, wouldn't necessarily fill the Granada, but they would exactly. be perfect fits exactly. for this. Exactly, okay. yes, that's right. It's not meant to uh, replace the Granada. The Granada is, is a terrific facility, but it's 1,600 seats. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is, that's going to serve a particular type of mm -hmm. performance. And the Victoria, or the new Vic, as we're calling it, will um, serve a different kind, uh, smaller more intimate performances. Let, let's maybe shift gears to that a little bit to your 2013, uh, you know, 14 yeah. season. This is a, a season that will be in this fantastic new space. Mm -hmm. And to what extent have you programmed the season with that thought in mind? Well, we were really thinking bigger mm -hmm. this next year. Uh, we did want to utilize the theater. We wanted to uh, choose plays that stretched us, but also made it clear why we needed to move into this new facility. And so we're opening with a little night music, the Sondheim musical, uh, which we could never have done in our former facility. We just didn't have the space for it. Uh, this is going to be a terrific uh, show. It's a cast of 11 plus five musicians. Wow. And uh, we're, even that is scaled back from the Broadway. It's not going to be, um, we're not trying to replicate the Broadway production or Broadway sound, it's really 
uh, um, I think lends itself to being a terrific chamber musical. Okay. And we have uh, several terrific performers cast. We're still casting. Um, we still have a few more parts to cast. But uh, we have uh, at the uh, the le leading the cast are Stephanie Zimbalist, whom our audiences will rem remember from a few other pr productions. Much beloved here in Santa Barbara. That's right. Yes. And then Piper Laurie, who's a terrific uh, act stage actress and, and also was a theater actress, and uh, she's coming up to play Madame Armfelt. And Patrick Cassidy, who is also a terrific uh, Broadway performer. Um, he's got a famous family. His mother is Shirley Jones. Oh, wow. Uh, his half-brother is David Cassidy. Wow. Uh, uh, and he's uh, a wonderful performer, and he's playing Frederick. Okay. So those are the three uh, leading the cast. Okay, so that's the, the very first performance of the show, a musical. That's right. Uh, it's a musical. Yeah, and, and why, why a musical? Again, we wanted to originally we do have an area for musicians under the stage. There's a little musician's pit. Um, I actually decided to put the mu musicians on the stage because I actually like that kind of concept. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, a Little Night Music is, is a show I've been wanting to do for several years. And you're directing. And I'm directing it. I think it's really such a charming piece. The, the lyrics, as Sondheim's lyrics usually are, are so clever and so fun. And it deals with this people going through a midlife crisis, so it speaks to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, good People is, is after that. Yeah, I love this play, Good People. It is, uh, there's a reason why it's one of the most produced plays of the last year or two across the country. Uh, David Lindsay Abair is the playwright. It's a comic drama about a woman who lives in South Boston, <clears throat> as people in Boston call it, Southie. She's fallen on hard times. She's about to get evicted. And in desperation, she seeks out her uh, old high school boyfriend, who managed to become a successful doctor and move out of South Boston and into the wealthy suburbs. And he's not terribly happy to see her. It sort of throws him off guard. And it's about that relationship. And uh, it's a brilliant uh, play with a lot of plot twists and a lot of um, interesting interesting plot developments. So a great chance to see it here in Santa Barbara. Yeah, yeah, you know. great. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the next play, Metamorphoses, I saw the Looking Glass 20-year um, of uh, remounting in Chicago last winter with my daughter. Mm. This is a spectacular play. It's, <laughs> mm -hmm. You're going to get wet, probably, for one thing. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit about what, what this play involves. Well, it is a theatrical adaptation of Greek mythological tales by Ovid. Uh, and it is told through movement and um, music and uh, uh, it all centers around the pool of water. At least that's how it was originally conceived. And we're going to try and do that. We have an area in our new theater that's a removable part of the stage and we are planning to use that to have the water element. Uh, and it's true that the people in the front row may well get wet and we're actually going to be providing them with ponchos. Right. But uh, it is uh, a terrific theatrical event and something that's very unusual. It's the kind of thing that you can't see on television or in film. It's the, it's the type of work that theater ma that makes theater so special. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, uh, partly, it's the tactile sense of, of you know potentially getting wet. It's the sound of the water That's out right. there, and and just great use of props. And it also is going to give people a chance to sort of remember their mythology. That's it? right. <laughs> That's right. Mini mythology. Lessons. Some of, a couple of them are very well known stories. There's King Midas. Everything he touches turns to gold. There's Orpheus uh, and Eurydice, um, where he goes to the underworld to reclaim his wife. Um, and is told not to look back at her. So those tales may be familiar, and then there are others that are less familiar, but uh, it all works together really beautifully. It's a remarkable piece. When I chose it, I didn't realize it was gonna be the 20th anniversary of that piece. Um, I saw it in New York just after 9-11, so in 2001, and the piece itself deals with death and rebirth mm -hmm. and transformation. Uh, and uh, the audience was very raw. I mean, it was, we, all our emotions were quite raw because of the events that had just happened. And it was the kind of piece that New Yorkers really needed to see at that time. It's an interesting piece, too, because um, 
at least that's the, I, the way I saw it, the actors are on stage, the lights are up all the time. Um, there's a lot of little great stagecraft, people kind of going underwater in this little tiny pool and disappearing for minutes on end. And, and um, it's it's just, I think it's a, it's a special experience. Yes, it is. Now, I'm, I'm not exactly sure exactly how we're going to do it. Okay. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no drownings or anything but like I, that. I have, yeah. I have talked to our set designer <laughs> about ways in which we might have theatrical magic uh, be a part of it. Well, let's go to the, the fourth show. Now, we're, we've been talking with March and April. We're going to go to, to May of 2014. This right. is a ways off, but the next play is, is Red by John Logan. Right. That's also a play I've been wanting to do for several years now um, because I, I, I think the script itself is such a dynamic uh, theatrical event. It has a, um, a lot of sparks and fire between the two characters. It is a two-person play. One character is Mark Rothko, who is uh, a well-known painter. The play takes place in the early 60s, like 1960 or 61. Um, it's kind of based on a true, story, true, true part of Mark Rothko's life, which is that he was commissioned to paint the murals for a new Four Seasons restaurant. Uh, and then in real life, he basically canceled the project and gave back the money, and, and no one ever knew why. Mm. In this play, he's paired with a young protege, and this part is fictional. Uh, and he, uh, the protege who is there learns from him. It's one of those relationships where the son overtakes the father or the student overtakes the teacher, but the, but the young protege starts to call into question whether Mark Rothko is selling out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very theatrical. There's one climactic moment in the play where the two of them are painting a canvas, and it is extraordinarily electric and sensual. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, th that, I mean, that would be a great penultimate piece, but I know you typically like to end on a, on a lighter note, if at all possible. <clears throat> yeah, that's often the case, and we are this year, too. We have this fantastic new comedy called Looped uh, about Tallulah Bankhead, and uh, the term looped is has a double meaning, so, uh, the story takes place, and this is also a true story, uh, she had to go into loop some of her dialogue uh, for her final film, Die, Die, My Darling. Looping means to redub in a studio. Um, but also she was looped. She was inebriated she was and yeah. she, was, she was on drugs, and so it took forever that day and so this is a Eight comedy. Hours, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> and, this, and so this is a comedy about her trying to get this one line of dialogue and the relationship between her and the, um, sound, the director of that looping uh, session. And um, we're thrilled that it brings Marsha Mason to us. Um, she, the film star, she will be playing Tallulah Bankhead. Uh, <clears throat> Marsha was, Marcia was in town and we took her on a tour of the theater space while it was still under construction and she just loved it. And she said, okay, I want to be a part of your first season. So. Wow, that's very flattering. Yes. So as we, you know, we kind of think about winding up here, I, I'm, I'm curious to know, there's always something that you're trying to do special to reach out to school kids. I know this mm -hmm. time there's a, an educator's discount. Um, you can, what, are, what are some of the things that you're... <clears throat> that's, that's exactly right. So we now have a new educator's at a discount and also anyone who works for a nonprofit can get a discounted subscription. Um, there, there are certain days it's available. Um, and then um, we have something called $20 for 20-somethings, and that is um, single tickets for any of our shows uh, are, if you're 29 or under, they're only $20, and if you, and if you buy a subscription, it's even cheaper than that. Uh, we're also reaching out by, we're also planning a number of um, events to coincide with our pr productions. Uh, it's a program called ETC, etc. And um, it may include uh, wine tastings, gallery showings, trips to LA, for example, with the Rothko one, I think we're looking at maybe a trip down to Mocha, um, things like that. We still have our book club, which is uh, doing, you know, very popular, and um, and then, oh, um, well, this will air after we we, we um, do this. But we have two series of uh, two weeks of events 
before we open the build, um, right after we open the building and before our first production, um, that we'll have an uh, open house for the community and uh, lots of parties. Just so people come um, in and see the Right, so I'm mentioning it now anyway because if someone's missed that open house, you know, come by, and, back come by and take a look. Okay. Well, it, it, as I say goodbye, I, I want to also say goodbye to one of Creative Community's favorite folks, which is Jim Breen, uh, who's been with uh, Ensemble Jim's, for a while. Jim's with, been with Ensemble for um, many years before I joined as a press rep. He, but when I joined and we met, I offered him a full-time job, and he uh, took it. <laughs> and uh, even though he was not, I don't think at the time, terribly interested in a full-time job, so he's been with us for as long as I've been here, seven years as a full-time marketing director, and he is semi-retiring. He's planning on doing um, lots of projects uh, on his own and, and freelance and, and things like that. So he'll be with us through the end of the year. Okay. And we'll wish him the very best. Yes. Yeah. And we will wish you also the very best for your, your first season. Thanks. Congratulations. I hope everyone comes out and, and sees what we do. All right. So Roman Baratiak, we're here on the steps of the Sunken Garden uh, to talk about uh, UCSB Arts and Lectures. It's a real treat to be here with you, David. Yeah. It's um, something we do annually, and I always look forward to it. And I always look forward to, to hearing from you what's going to happen, because it's, it's such a smorgasbord of events. Right. So uh, UCSB Arts and Lectures, you know, we do events throughout the year. Actually, in the summer, we're here doing uh, our summer film That's program right, yeah. with the uh, County Arts Commission. So it's fun to be back here uh, on a much more peaceful day than <laughs> typically. But, uh, you know, we've pretty much wrapped up our fall quarter uh, of activity. So we'll be moving into our 2014 schedule. Mm -hmm. and we've got lots of great performances, lectures, and films coming up. And lectures and films are kind of your specialty as the associate uh, director. Yeah, that's right. So I've been putting together the lecture and film program for over 30 years, and uh, I think we've got some good things happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to give you some little highlights. If Tell you us about it, yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, we have still uh, one more event coming up in December. It's Rick Steves who many people are familiar with. People love Rick Steves, don't they? They do, they yeah. do. He's the David Sedaris of travel writers. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, well we hope they will turn out. It's gonna be at the Granada Theater, uh, December the 9th. Rick's gonna be uh, coming and giving a talk to us, sort of a pre-holiday presentation about uh, all things travel. Right, really. yeah. And he's got such a, a great warm presence. He's, he's funny, um, his guidebooks of course are, you know, absolutely uh, used by everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. So after Rick Steves, what's, uh, what's going on? Well, we'll have a very busy winter quarter. I'll, I can tell you some of the highlights. Sure. Um, we have Dave Barry, the comic writer, Great coming humorous, to give a presentation, right? Yeah. right? We've presented Dave before. Uh, actually, this will be our third time presenting Dave. That's also at the Granada Theater. Uh, someone we've never presented, Gloria Steinem, really kind of the, one of the founding figures of the modern feminist mm -hmm. movement. Uh, she'll be speaking for us in February. I'm thrilled, one of my favorite people, Garrison Keillor, right. is coming back again. I'll give a presentation in April. Uh, we're doing our National Geographic Live series. Uh, we have Robert Ballard, uh, you know, the discoverer of the right, wreck of right, the Titanic. Right. So he's going to talk about underwater. Yeah, he has lots of new things he's constantly working on. So he'll be talking about sort of new adventures. Uh, under the oceans mm -hmm. and uh, we're always adding people and I know your area of interest is poets right so uh, we do have the former poet laureate Billy Collins coming in a right. joint program with Amy Mann wild combination isn't yeah it? I love both uh, both those individuals but I would never pair them together yeah so uh, we'll find out how it goes but <laughs> this is their 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 joining together yeah that's uh -huh. right that Billy does the occasional joint program with uh -huh. uh, somebody who he finds interesting and this uh -huh. time he's doing it with Amy. Yeah. Uh, we also have Coleman Barks uh, right. coming, you know, really the, the great Rumi. Absolutely, poet, the yeah. person who's really made Rumi and Hafez known to a Western audience. 
Uh, we're just adding uh, the former poet laureate Philip Levine. Okay. In January, he was the poet, U.S. poet laureate between 2011 and 12, and uh, working on trying to get the poet David White. I'm not familiar with mm -hmm. him, but uh, got a big following. So. Those are some of the people that we're looking at yeah. for winter well, and into early spring. Yeah, it's interesting to me how you select this. I know people are out on tour and you're kind of looking at through the different booking agencies, right. but is there any one particular way that you find this perfect guest? Uh, well, I'm not sure they're the perfect guest, but we do it the best <laughs> we can. So uh, I'm, I'm always trying to keep up on who's on book tour because mm -hmm. it's beneficial for us to be able to schedule someone at the same time that they're getting major national right coverage and they have some new material that they're excited to present and so I, I try to pay attention to that and then there are sort of the tried and true favorites people like Garrison Keillor who you know is always going to give a phenomenal David evening. Sedaris is, is going to be back am I David right? Sedaris will yeah. be back again he's become a bit of a uh, Santa Barbara institution he really has yeah. people just continue to come out in droves to hear David and um, doesn't have anything new particularly, but he's always trying out new work. Uh -huh. So that's a good ticket to get ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, 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 we've actually sold probably half a house at this point for David. Wow, so. and we're talking here in October right Right, now. <laughs> right, and he's, he's at the end of February this year, okay. so a little bit earlier than normal. So as you move into the, the spring quarter, the end of the, the, the season, what's, what's going on then? Uh, well, we're currently working on that. I have another writer who's got a uh, incredible fan base who's never been to Santa Barbara named Ann Patchett. Mm -hmm. Wrote an important book called Bel Canto, right. but she's uh, done work since then. So we haven't publicly announced that. This is actually the first oh, okay. uh, public notice of that. Tickets are not even for sale yet. So she'll be coming in April. Okay. Uh, and still in the process of trying to put some other interesting activities together. There's another um, interesting writer, Gar uh, Gary Steingart, mm -hmm. contributes regularly to The New Yorker. He's got a following. Funny guy, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, I don't want to make it sound like all we do is writers. We're also bringing in interesting people in the world of politics, current affairs. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got a few kind of big name people that uh, we're working on right now that haven't 100% come together. Still fishing. But okay. keep in touch. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, first of all, I think we want to thank the Arts Commission before we, we move over to Celesta. And um, it's great for them to give us access to the Sunken Garden. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, such a wonderful location. And I have to say, Jenny Brush, who actually gets to have an office here, in the rotunda turret here at the courthouse. Right. What a wonderful place to be uh, working. So yeah. we've had a great collaboration with Ginny uh, over the years, not only for the summer film program here at the courthouse, but the Arts Commission has been very supportive of our work throughout yeah. the year. Well, and Ginny's been fabulous to just about everybody in town. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Double up our thanks. Let us um, say goodbye to you, Roman, and, and say hello to Celeste. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Dave. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, Celeste, it's great to see you magically appear here uh, as Roman <laughs> vanishes. Yes. Um, you are the uh, Miller McCune director of Arts and Lectures. Um, you have some things that you want to talk about. Roman's talked about lectures and films. So tell us more what else is uh, happening this Well, I mean, year. one of our strengths at Arts and Lectures is the diversity of the programming. I mean, I think we always like to say we have something for everyone. And we have an incredible family series. We just had some great events happen this fall for, for kids ages four and up. Okay. And um, so the family series is very popular and we, we've had two great events this fall and continue, continuing on through the winter and spring. We encourage people to go on the website. We have um, live theater for children, we have film series for children, and we have a great rock band called Milkshake. Okay. And our family series uh, involves you know craft tables and face painting and balloons all beforehand, all free and underwritten. Yeah and uh, we hope families will come out and it's very, very popular. Events sell out, so we encourage families to buy the tickets ahead of time. And what's great is that it's very affordable. The low price, uh, making sure that lots of, lots of families can come and access is not an issue. So. Well, and, and that's so important is to nurture the next generation exactly. of people who are support the arts. So exactly. you're doing it really young at four. <laughs> right, and then you fast forward to the Vienna Philharmonic <laughs> where the average age is. No, I mean, uh, the Vienna Philharmonic arguably and by most people's standards the, the best orchestra in the world is coming back to Santa Barbara wow. and they'll be here in March uh -huh. and um, we're very very proud to bring them back to Santa Barbara and so we hope people will come out for them in March 
Um, they're incredible, they're one of a kind, and they have a great uh, Italian conductor with them, with them this time, Daniel Gatti. Mm -hmm. And so um, you really can't see the Vienna Philharmonic unless you fly to New York to the Carnegie Hall to see them, or if you fly to Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, and or if you drive down the street in Santa Barbara. <laughs> if you drive down the street in Santa Barbara. So um, it's really special. Yeah. And this may be the last time they'll be able to come through our town, so we really encourage people to come. It's, it's really it's impossible to describe them. You have to be in the hall experiencing them and experiencing the way they, the way they sound. Mm -hmm. It's just it's, it's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So we encourage everyone to come out for that. Who else are you really, really excited about? Well, I mean, my, everybody, right? Well, one of my favorites, and everyone's favorites, is Yo-Yo Ma. Right. And, um, but Yo-Yo's coming in a really unusual, uh, well, I'd say unusual, because he hasn't been in this format in almost 25 years here, I think, or 30 years. Um, he's coming in a, in a regular recital. He's performing with Catherine Stott, his longtime accompanist, and he's doing just a straight recital, cello and piano. Mm. And he's done lots of solo recitals here. He's been here with the Silk Road Project. Um, he's given talks and lectures, but this is a straight Yo-Yo Ma recital, which is just brilliant, mm -hmm. and um, we're bringing him back. Um, you mentioned the Silk Road. Yeah, the Silk Road we had this last fall, mm -hmm. which is great, and that's one of Yo-Yo's passions, and of course we love world music, right. and um, we have some wonderful world music projects this spring as well. Um, but yeah, Yo-Yo is a great, a great, mm -hmm. a great wonder, wonderkin for us. Mm -hmm. We'd love to bring him. Yeah. Um, what else do we have this spring? Well, we have the Royal New Zealand Ballet bringing Giselle. Um, we try to, we love our dance series, we're very passionate about that. I always say I'm passionate about dance, but we've never brought that company. And it's directed by Ethan Stiefel, he's a former American Ballet Theater superstar dancer. So he's bringing under his direction his version of Giselle. And this is the big Giselle, this is the big Giselle. So um, to see the Royal New Zealand Ballet with a full length, three quarter length, two twos, uh, it's going to be beautiful. So um, we hope everybody will come out for that. And then we have contemporary dance with uh, Cedar Lake Contemporary Ballet, okay. Wayne McGregor, it's a random dance which is really out there from the UK. And then we have Kyle a Abraham, which is a hip hop company out of New York. And he just won the MacArthur Genius Award, oh, this wow. young guy. And we're presenting him out in Campbell Hall. So we have a great dance series um, after January, so we hope people will come. And then in December for the holidays, um, one of our favorites also that we're bringing back for Santa Barbara, and Santa Barbara seems to love them, is Pete Martini. Right. And we've had Pete Martini many times, but we've never had their holiday show. So China Forbes, who is their eloquent and beautiful singer, is coming, and we're having the holiday show in the Arlington. It's almost sold out, so if by people are interested, this, yeah, yeah, uh, people better buy their tickets that. very yeah, fast uh, because it's, uh, it's definitely going to be a very popular one. Well, you know, as you're saying, all these people, you're rattling up names and <laughs> ideas, and, and it, it strikes me that when you're not here in Santa Barbara programming the shows, you must be out looking at a lot of different things. Well, that's true. I do go to New York, and I used to travel a lot more, but I have a young son, so I don't travel right. as much now. But I do get out, and um, I love to work, find and discover new artists to bring to Santa Barbara. I think one of my goals is to make it so that people don't have to leave Santa Barbara, so that things that you may read about in the New York Times, artists or projects, um, might show up on our series and then you say, wow, I saw that in I Santa believe, Barbara. Yeah, right. I can't believe this is coming through here first. Yeah. Oh, uh, in fact, this just this last fall, we were one of the first people to bring a project that no one has ever presented um, in a major way, which is Ira Glass with two dancers. Right. And Ira Glass, a great NPR um, uh, on-air on, on -air personality, did a program with two dancers and we're the only the third presenter in the country to present this work. So it was a real gamble, mm -hmm. but it paid off, it was wonderful. And so now it's going all over the country, but we did it, we could say we you did it, one of the first yeah. to do it, right. <laughs> so we like to do that. Well, it's an expensive venture to bring all these it people is. in. It's not, ticket sales aren't gonna cover everything. <laughs> right, thank you for that lead in. Um, <laughs> so yes, we are a not-for-profit. People sometimes ask me, oh, you're at the university, they must cover everything. And, and I always say, no, that's not true. Um, the university's great, but uh, we are a not-for-profit, just like the symphony or CAM or anybody else in town. So we have to pay our bills and raise money just like everyone else. And so, in fact, right now we're in the middle of a $20 million campaign. We've worked on this for years, and basically half of that money is for a $10 million endowment. And we have no endowment for this program. And that oh, wow. endowment is, is really critical for this program to continue on. What we're trying to do is raise money to continue 
um, oh the bells <laughs> to continue <laughs> the bells. The, to continue the the great the great work that we're doing for the community and to subsidize the ticket prices to keep them low where they are. I mean, people always tell me they cannot believe how low our ticket prices mm -hmm. are. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, is to maintain the quality and the access for the community of Santa Barbara and to, and to secure this program for the future. And um, that's what this whole campaign is about, is not to get bigger, but just to secure it for the future and make sure that it's here for everybody to enjoy, the four-year-olds and up, mm -hmm. and um, the people that live here and work very hard in this community to enjoy it. Yeah. And as the bells ring, <laughs> that's kind of a nice note, as it were, to end on. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure, as always, to, to see you in Roman. And as people look on the website and, and see all the fantastic things, things always being added, too. Right, I mean, it's, right. just, it's good to keep up because just because you have the program doesn't mean you're going to see everything. I think that's an excellent point. I would really encourage people to get on our mailing list and mm -hmm. go on the website. The one thing I always stress is that we're, we may surprise you where we show up. We're all over town. Right. We're at the Music Academy. We're at the Libero. We're we're going to be at you know the at new, the new Vic, at the yeah. new Vic. We're at the Granada. We're at the Arlington. We're out at our home base at Campbell Hall. We're we're going to use Fleischmann Auditorium. We're all over town, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's also great about arts and lectures is that um, we're very diverse and mobile, and we're flexible, and we do different types of programming that will show up and surprise you. Mm -hmm. So you never know where you might find us. Yeah, well, thanks so much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. The Creative Community is produced with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm David Starkey, and thanks for watching.